Let's face it, being in our 20s is one of the most confusing times. What is my purpose? What makes me happy? How will I achieve my dreams? Some of us spend our entire lives trying to figure it out. Yeah, it's not easy, but there's always a way. My way. I'm Jazzy, and I'm in the process of paving my own path in this journey we call life. Will you share your my way with me? This is Jason Ma, and this is my way. Hi, Jason. How are you today? What up, what up, what up? I'm good, Jazzy. How are you? I'm just uh, chilling in downtown LA. I'm aloft in quarantine. You know, with this global pandemic going on, how have you really been these days? Um, <laughs> I personally love it. My, my history and pattern for the last 15, almost 20 years has been on an airplane every 72 hours to every week. Um, literally in another country, another city airports, LAX, and it gets really, really tiring and really exhausting. And I don't think we realize how much time we lose uh, by just spending time traveling. And so I've been so much more productive in the pandemic because I don't have to, A, drive around in LA traffic uh, and waste literally hours a day going from one place <laughs> to the next. Um, I don't have to fly around in airplanes every 72 hours uh, across Asia and around the world uh, and waste time there as well. And mm -hmm. by the way, getting fatter because you're eating airport food every single day and you got nothing better mm -hmm. to do than <laughs> have food and, and drinks. Um, so I've been very productive. I think the idea of just being forced to have virtual meetings, although I'm, I know many people don't prefer to have virtual meetings, but they prefer to meet in person, uh, which mm -hmm. is something that you can't um, you you can't exchange for, right? There's a, there's a personal uh, in person touch that you can't get anywhere else, uh, even virtually. But if we're just talking about getting things done and communicating mm -hmm. and making sure that uh, things get executed, Zoom, Google Hangout, whatever, FaceTime, audio, regular phone calls are actually mm -hmm. fine. And so now. I'm able to get anywhere from 10 to 16 meetings or calls in a day because uh, uh, I work U.S. time and Asia time, right? Um, which is my life, uh, hence East West. Whereas before, I might be lucky to get four to six meetings in a day, right? Um, and so I'm able to get so much more done. And because I'm not flying around, I'm not tired, I'm not checking into a hotel, you know, I'm not like going from here to there. Um, I'm, a, I'm a lot more fresh, I'm a lot more focused, um, and things are just that much more flexible. Um, so I love it. And so I, even though I'm an extrovert, I think uh, I'm also very much an introvert. So I, I love mm -hmm. being alone and I love just being in my little loft here, Zoom calling away like I am with you right now. Well, Jason, you have certainly pioneered a unique yet vital bridge between the East and the West in business, entertainment, and media. And I'm sure your journey through it all has been unconventional, to say the least. How did it all begin? Did you always know what you wanted to do? Um, it's a great question. Uh, I've shared this story before at talks and panels uh, and speeches. But, um, you know, when I was seven years old, my, my dad asked me what I want to be when I grew up. And so I took out a piece of white paper, I took out some crayons, and I drew three pictures of myself. Uh, one was me in a business suit with a tie and a suitcase. Uh, the second was me with a French Pierre cap, a paintbrush and a paint palette. And the third was me behind a pulpit inside a church with a crucifix behind me preaching. And so my father asked me, you know, what is this? And I was like, well, Dad, Monday through Friday, I'm going to be a businessman like you. And then I was like... <laughs> Saturday, I'm going to be an artist, and Sunday, I'm going to be a preacher. And my dad nice. in Cantonese was like, which means smart out. And uh, I can't explain it, but, you know, literally 30 whatever years later, right, I've actually am doing and have done uh, those three professions at different stages of my life. I know you entered the world of venture capital at a rather young age. Tell me about how that journey began. 
Yeah, um, it wasn't something I planned. You know, I had a very unorthodox path into venture capital, entrepreneurship, the entertainment media industry, um, even ministry. You know, I didn't go to Harvard, I didn't go to MIT, I didn't become an investment banker or an analyst, you know, crunching numbers and then work my way up. Very much the opposite of that. I grew up with Asian gangs and, you know, hip hop heads and, you know, got into a bunch of trouble. And uh, when I was at my fourth high school, because uh, I got kicked out pretty much out of three. Um, I had this born again experience where, you know, I, I met Jesus and I turned my life around, should have went to jail, uh, declared myself guilty for grand theft, but the, the judge actually, even though I pleaded guilty, d decided to let me go and, and, and declare me not guilty, which is impossible. Um, wow. And from there, I just wanted to, you know, make a difference with my life and help other young kids off the streets like myself I would bring them to this, this church in the east side of San Jose uh, that was empty. This Chinese American church that I went to. And on Tuesday nights, it was empty. And I would tell all my friends, hey, you know, come study the Bible and learn about Jesus with me for an hour. And after that, you know, the, the building and the dance floor is yours, right? And they would break dance and DJ and have ciphers and rap till, you know, past midnight. And it grew to hundreds and it became really, really like a phenomenon and a movement uh, at that time. This is like in the late 90s. And then around that time, uh, MC Hammer, I don't know if you're old enough to know who MC Hammer is, because uh, you're a Gen Zer. Uh, I am a, <laughs> I'm at the cusp and, and the beginning of being a millennial. Um, and so MC Hammer is a legendary hip hop rapper uh, from the Bay Area who pretty much was the first uh, rap artist to take rap pop with You Can't Touch This, Too Legit To Quit. He went diamond, which means you sold at least, you know, uh, uh, 10 million records. Um, and, and he really, you know, was a phenomenon and a, and a Bay Area hero. And so he started preaching at this mega church in San Jose where I live called Jubilee Christian Center every Sunday night. And he would teach a Bible study to 3,000 men. I would listen to him every Sunday for almost like a year. And, uh, but every year at my hip hop Bible study, we would do a big hip hop outreach uh, where we'd have like thousands of, of at risk youth come off the streets and have local artists perform and, and positive testimonies of kids who've had their lives changed. And I was just like, yo, that'd be so crazy and that'd be so dope if I got MC Hammer to come speak, right, and perform at my hip hop outreach. And and the hip hop Bible study was called Soul, S-O-U-L, uh, uh, stood for Shine on Us Lord. So it's called Soul Fellowship. And I chased him down for six months, uh, couldn't get past security, bodyguards, uh, people, you know, at the church, this is a mega church. It's like an institution. It's like a corporation. Right. And people are like, you know, sure. Like I give them a flyer, a letter, like, please talk to hammer for me. I, I'm trying to do this, you know, reach kids off the streets and went nowhere. And, uh, I was getting close to the event. And if I didn't get him, I was just going to not have him, you know, come and speak and perform and just find a replacement. Um, but somehow I, I just had this, you know, perseverance to not give up. And somehow I finally pushed through, met this one uh, associate pastor guy. I remember his name is Daryl, Pastor Daryl, and just talked him into it. And luckily he gave my letter to Hammer personally. And then Hammer came and met with me after a church service. And he agreed uh, to do it, to come speak and perform uh, to my hip hop Bible study and, um, and our outreach. And I guess he kind of saw I was like a hustler and he was kind of just like, mm -hmm. so... So what do you do? And I was like, uh, I just graduated high school. I work at a startup. Uh, we make you know websites for small, and medium sized businesses. We're you know we're located in Cupertino, right across from Apple Computer. He's like, really? He goes, I invest in startups. He goes, you're Asian. You must know how to use computers. Come work for me. And I was just like, MC Hammer, right? <laughs> and I was like, yo. So I literally quit my job like that week and I became his basically uh, executive assistant uh, uh, straight out of high school. And um, I basically worked for him and he became my first real boss and mentor. Um, and what's really crazy if you think about it, he was a perfect mentor for me because he's an entrepreneur in venture capital and he's also a rap artist and performer, uh, but he's also an ordained minister, right? Um, so, you know, God or odd, uh, but you know, I had no idea that he was really into venture capital and what he did in it. 
he had a very close friend, a guy named Ron Conway, uh, who's coined the godfather of Silicon Valley. He created the term angel investment. Uh, Ron was like the first check in Google and eBay and all the companies that we know now. Um, and so I always say that, you know, uh, uh, that partnership between Ron and Hammer uh, opened up the horizons for me because as a young personal assistant, I got to go to all these meetings, right? And, you know, I took him to his first meeting with YouTube when it was like five people above a pizza parlor in San Mateo, when Twitter was less than 10 people, when Salesforce was less than 10 people. And so really saw internet 2.0 and the revolution and the social disruption uh, erupt. And so, you know, Hammer's invested in dozens of companies now that are worth billions. And, uh, and I was just very, very blessed and very, very lucky uh, to be able to experience that uh, at a young age. Um, so that's how I got my foot in the door with VC, uh, was basically being MC Hammer's, you know, little lackey. He was like Batman and I was like Robin. Circling back to when you had this idea to pitch to a legend like MC Hammer at the age of 17, weren't you nervous? How did you find the courage to reach out to him? I'm impressed that you didn't give up after your first try. Well, I think sales or pitching an idea is, is really about your conviction and your belief in what you're selling, number one. Uh, and number two, it's about persistence. And number three, it's about perseverance, right? Uh, persistence is just continually knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking at that door, right? It's like, if my mom is just nagging me and nagging me and nagging me and nagging me, you know, to, 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 to eat that broccoli that I don't want to eat, I'll just somehow cave in and do it, right? Um, and perseverance is, like I said, just having that patience and, and that long-term view to, to keep going. Um, I think I learned a lot of that growing up. I was, a, I was a hustler. I didn't come from a wealthy family, a single parent home. You know, my mom raised me by just doing daycare and my two sisters. And so it was month to month. And you know, we really didn't know where the next check was going to come from. And so at the age of like 12, I started selling candy door to door. Um, Ooh. Oh, no, it doesn't sound as fabulous as as, as, as your response. Um, but uh, <laughs> I was like, you know, it was it was super, super thuggish, ghetto, illegal. OK, uh, so there was this one dude, this white dude, I remember, and he would pick up like 10 of us in this, you know, that, you know, those big white vans that you have the sliding door, no seats, no seat belts, just a bunch of boxes with candy, throws like, you know, 10 of us kids in there, 12, 13, 14 years old, right? Underage, not legally able to work. And he made up like this nonprofit organization called Youth in Action. And basically we would pretend, but we kind of were. We, I mean, we weren't like the wealthiest kids, but we were definitely like, not like, poor poor you know what i'm saying we weren't like mm -hmm. on the streets homeless begging but you know we didn't we came from low-income families but you know we basically went around to the gas station to knock on the door at your house or your apartment and be like hi ma'am i know you don't want to talk to me but i'm harmless my name's jason i work for youth in action youth in action is a non-profit organization that's helping horrible situation kids like myself who are in gangs and and tempted with drugs to get out of this horrible you know uh situation and the way we're doing this is by selling candy and if you can buy candy from me for five dollars whether it's this Reese's Pieces or whether it's this payday um then I will be able to raise money to help me get a real job and ultimately hopefully one day for the first time in my life go to Disneyland so we basically tell you know random people <laughs> off the streets this sad story right that they that they, they that they can't turn away and then I would just kind of look at them with like droopy eyes you know even though my eyes are so small but it doesn't matter but I was just like you know please help me right and so so he would drop us off in the craziest places in the hood in wealthy neighborhoods gas stations shopping malls you name it everywhere and anywhere but every single bar of candy we sold for five bucks uh, we would get a dollar commission all right so we would actually get 20% right so it was actually like a really good situation for a 12, 13, 14 year old where I would sell like 20 candy bars, right? A day within like a four Yay. to five hour period, right? And he would pay us in $1 bills. So at the end of the day, I'd have a stack of ones, right? And I'd be like putting that up in my pocket being like, yo, what's ah. up? That was, that was 
really my training, right? So he would drop us off in neighborhoods where there'd be gangs. He'd be dropping us in neighborhoods where there'd be a white supremacist. I got I got chased out one time by this, I guess, World War, Vietnam War veteran that had a shotgun calling me a gook and a chink. I mean, like, crazy scenarios. So all I'm trying to say is, like, was I scared of anybody? No. Uh, was I, you know, scared to pitch anything? Absolutely no, because I was already pitching and selling, you know what I'm saying, since I was 12, right? Um, and so I, I learned that. So it was, it was about, and I, I believed in it. I would say I believed in the product. I mean, the candy was a candy, but I believed in the commission. If I'm gonna sell one bar for five and I'm gonna get one, heck yes, right? Um, and then you gotta just continue to persist. And it's just a numbers game. You know, end of the day, it's just a numbers game. You gotta keep pitching. And maybe one out of 20 is gonna, is gonna, is, you're gonna sell. And, uh, and that's, that's the sales game. Wow, Jason, at the age of 12, you are already getting real life experience and honing that sales game. You've had the opportunity to be in both positions as a serial entrepreneur, pitching your vision for numerous companies, and as an investor, listening to pitches given to you. First, let's talk about your experience as an entrepreneur. In school, we may have learned the idea of pitching, but we didn't actually experience what the process is like. Where do you even begin? Does cold calling or emails even work anymore in this day and age? I'm one of those interesting and unique investors that I actually do check my LinkedIn. Um, and so mm -hmm. I will, you know, really kind of just breeze through it sometimes to see if it's someone legitimate for my network um, that's reaching out. Um, and, but most of the time it's, 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 it's nonsense and, and just distractions, but I do check it. Um, at the same time, I will cold call and email people till to, the, till to this day, right? And so like, you know, recently, there was someone at Lightspeed Ventures, I don't want to say the name, but one of the partners there, I just cold called, emailed LinkedIn him, and he responded, you know? Oh. And, you know, and so this is one of the top VCs in the world, in Silicon Valley. So, you know, I think that you just have nothing to lose if you just try, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing to lose by trying. And so I think, number one, uh, going back to what we are discussing before with sales, uh, it, it is about trying meaning it's a numbers game right you just got to go out there and pitch to a hundred people to a thousand investors if you can and i guarantee if you pitch to a thousand investors there's gonna be at least 10 right that are going to actually listen to what you actually have to say and what you're trying to do and so uh absolutely you should be reaching out you should be pitching you should be going around all avenues that you can um, to 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 connect, you know, with with investors or those that can support your idea, um, and so that 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 is something I still do. Even though I'm an investor on the other side, I have other projects that I need investment from still, right? And so I will go out and I'll cold call. I'll ask friends if they know this investor. I'll check my LinkedIn network, my Facebook network, my WeChat network. You know, I'll see who's first, second, third, primary, super primary connection, you know, <laughs> to, to whoever it is and be like, hey, do you know this founder? Do you know this investor? And can you connect me? You know what I'm saying? And so it is all that that's the hustle, right? Is doing the extra mile, going the extra mile, you know, running that extra yard. Uh, that's what makes the difference. And what is your secret to capture the investor's heart? I think it goes back to sales. It goes back to passion and conviction on your mission and your product, right? I think entrepreneurs are problem solvers. We are intrinsically uh, t a certain type of personality where we can't stand things not working. That's e essentially what entrepreneurs do. We see problems in society, in, in sectors of enterprise, and we go, you know what, this can be a lot more efficient. This can be a lot more effective. This can be done with sh in a shorter time span, right? This is done in a way that is just wrong, right, or unjust. And we wanna go out and create something, a product, a platform, a solution that can actually bring an answer to that problem and make the world a better place. You're right, entrepreneurs are essentially problem solvers. Let's take one of the companies you started, 88 Rising, for example. Tell me about the founding story and what problem you saw that led you to create it. Um, it was interesting. So, you know, 2014, uh, there was a lot of new digital media brands uh, springing up on YouTube at, uh, in China, uh, in Weibo and WeChat, the equivalents of YouTube and Twitter in the U.S. And so from influencers and KOLs or key, inf 
key opinion leaders, you know, starting their own platforms and, and their own channels to Vice Media, Vox Media, BuzzFeed, Tastemade, you know, you name it. There's all these digital media companies popping up, multi-channel networks like Maker Studios and Machinima and Fullstream. And at that time, I was just thinking to myself, like, wow, like a lot of the YouTube viewership is coming from Asia. And there's hundreds of millions, if not billions, of Asian young people who are consuming content digitally through their mobile phone, mainly on YouTube, social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, at the time, Instagram, or Weibo, WeChat, etc. in China. And so I thought to myself, this is kind of ridiculous that there isn't a digital media channel on these UGC platforms that's focused on Asian youth culture and driven by my experience, music, right? Because I grew up in Hong Kong in the summer times uh, when I was a kid growing up to my teenage years and I used to always watch MTV Asia or a channel called Channel V. And this was all cable, right? I'm sure South Korea had a similar, maybe it was Mnet or something like that, you know, but it was cable. <laughs> but 2014, no one's watching cable, no one's watching TV. Channel V, MTV, it's, it's, it's of the last generation. And so to me, I was like, you know what, what if I started a music channel like an MTV Asia or a Channel V, but on YouTube, right? Uh, and then we had our own artists that we could promote, right? And then there'll be other stories and content that we could create. And so I knew that the Sonys and Warners and Universal Music Groups, the large labels, were not gonna back, one, a digital Asian music channel on YouTube, huh? What, what does that mean? Two, Asian music artists from Asia that somehow will go to America and go global, not happening. So I knew they wouldn't get it. So I knew I had to go and raise venture capital, which was my background and my relationships and my network and where I came from. And so I remember I, 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 I went out to raise capital uh, with, with my co-founder. He was currently at the time uh, at Vice Media before I met him, but before I met him, uh, I met a guy named Alan Dugvois from a fund called Third Way Ventures, and they invested in Drama Fever, uh, they in invested in Machinima, uh, All Deaf Digital, which was an African-American uh, digital uh, kind of music and comedy channel, Me Too, MITU, uh, which was a Latin American, kind of a multi-channel network. And so when I was introduced to him, actually through my friend Tony, he, he started a company called Channel Factory, he introduced me to Alan, and I met with Alan, I said, so you funded all these digital media brands and companies, and, and, and you funded African American, you funded Latin American, what about Asian? And he was like, yeah, what about Asian? <laughs> I was like, yo, what's up with that? What's up with that, dude, right? And, and he was like, what about Asian? And he was like, Jason, if you put together a team and a business plan, I'll write the first check. And Ooh. so I literally had a offer from him and I then needed how to find a team <laughs> and then I, I needed to go and, 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 and put together a plan. And so my friend Justin Chan, uh, if you don't know who Justin Chan is, he's now a very famous Korean American director that just did Miss Purple and Gook and others. But before that, he was the first Asian actor in Twilight, uh, if you remember that. Ah, uh, uh -huh. And so Justin was like, yo, because uh, I told him my idea. Uh, basically, I was like, I want to start like a, like a Vice Media MTV for Asia, but d uh, digital. And he was like, you should talk to my friend, Sean. He actually works at Vice. And I think if you guys connect, um, you know, something big could happen. And so he connected me with Sean and, you know, our, our minds met and we basically went out to go raise. Uh, and true to uh, Alan's word, he wrote that first check. Then I brought in Steve Chen, co-founder of YouTube. Uh, I brought in uh, uh, CBC Capital, former chairman, uh, Luminary Ventures. I brought in uh, Spark Labs Global, which is a South Korean Y Combinator and one of the top VCs out of South Korea. And then I brought in GDP Ventures, uh, which was uh, the biggest digital media venture uh, platform in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. And so I specifically in raised capital, right, from each of these investors because they all represented areas that I knew I needed resources in, which was Silicon Valley, Steve Chen, Silicon Beach, which was third wave, South Korea, the home of K-pop, Southeast Asia, the new emerging market in Asia, and of course, Luminary, Greater China, right? And so we started with that. And originally, I remember when I, before I closed the seed round of funding, which we raised two and a half million dollars, I, I went you know, to like 50 plus VCs, maybe more, right? And I remember a lot of these VCs didn't understand what we're talking about. I was like, I wanna create like a digital you know, music label and channel for Asian youth culture. And they're kind of just like, huh? And, I, and, the, and the way I finally figured out, how can I get them to parallel one thing to this thing that I wanted to create? So I would go into these meetings and they wouldn't get it. And then I would ask them, I'd say, hey, have you ever heard of Vice Media? And they're like, 
Vice, of course. And I was like, what's the valuation of Vice right now? And they're like, I think recently five billion. I said, yeah, we're the Asian Vice. We're called Rice. And literally, they just started writing checks. Like people just started like writing checks, right? But we were never really gonna call it Rice. And it was R-Y-C-E is because we want to kind of like make it kind of cool. <laughs> but not but but you know i'm talking to like you know these vcs that don't understand asian culture one and then second media right uh but i think that was the parallel so they finally got it oh a digital youth media platform right and and of course we ended up calling it ada rising um and now it is what it is tens of million subscribers multi-billion views um and and home to some of the greatest asian artists from asia who have now broken out globally on the Billboard charts, and it's it's been it's been it's been an amazing ride. You seem to have had a well thought out strategy for which investors to reach out to. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs who are just starting out and trying to figure out how to raise capital? Um, it's not easy. Uh, the the VC community is a very close knit community. It's a very club mentality. Um, and you know the top VCs kind of just trade deals with other top VCs and make more money for each other. Um, and it's, it's this whole Silicon Valley mafia, right? It's like the Illuminati, right? And so, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's like how, if I'm you know, graduating from USC and I wanna go start a consumer tech app, how do I get in touch with a venture capitalist that would actually give me the time to pitch my idea so they can actually invest. Um, it's, it's not easy, right? Because it's about relationships, connections, and whether you can uh, know who these people are and whether they wanna know you and hear your idea. Uh, like I said, number one, uh, just start from the baseline. Blast them, spam them, right? LinkedIn, right? Pay for a premium account, right? So you can go in and message as many people as you want because you just never know, right? Get them on social media, follow their Instagram, their Twitter, research who are the top VCs, who are top investors, you know? But again, don't look at the top echelon of venture capital, which is like I said, this kind of mafia network, right? It might be a friend of a friend's uncle. You know what I'm saying? It might be someone in your family. It might be your uncle, it might be your aunt, right? It might be your sister, it might be your brother, it might be your parents, right? And so really go first and think about who within your ecosystem and your sphere of influence and your relationships is the lowest hanging fruit. Because we start with family and friends. Once you get your family and friends, then you start thinking about, okay, strategics and then later institutionals. Mm. Media glorifies entrepreneurship. And especially these days, it seems to be the hottest trend to start your own business and be your own boss. But in reality, the life of an entrepreneur is an arduous one. Tell me about some of the hardships you've encountered as an entrepreneur. Uh, do you want to have a therapy session and, and check me into <laughs> a mental hospital and, and talk about this for the next 10 hours? Um, an entrepreneur, number one, is not an easy job. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, I would suggest you reading about entrepreneurship there's thousands of books um and many many great ones um number two get to know an entrepreneur that you have access to and ask them questions of of what it's like and what it takes to be an entrepreneur uh and number three i would say start with a small project you know start with something that you know you can do from scratch uh, whether it's a lemonade stand or selling candy, you know, at 12, um, or maybe it's a school project, or maybe it's just, you know, an idea that you know you can do without a lot of money, right? Um, because entrepreneurship is all about sacrifice. You sacrifice what normal people would not normally sacrifice in order to achieve your mission and your purpose. I'm talking about sacrifice like sleep, like a love life, <laughs> like a social life. Uh, you know, it's a lo it's lonely. It, it, leadership is lonely at top, at the top, and 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 it's no different. An entrepreneur is a leader. An entrepreneur is trying to serve others with a bigger idea because they believe they can solve 
you know, a systemic issue or societal problem. And so it's about sacrifice. It's about suffering. It's about knowing that you believe in something so much that you're willing to suffer for it and many times die for it. You know, uh, whether it's Elon Musk that's, you know, over and over had his companies go bankrupt or almost go bankrupt and, and literally have nothing in the bank and, and still standing up and believing that Tesla was going to win one day when everyone and the public and the media was smashing him and bashing him and saying, this is stupid. This electric vehicle thing is dumb. And OK, yeah, really? Ten years later is now probably the most valuable company in the world. OK. You have to have, you know, a, a strong backbone. You know, you have to have the ability uh, to stand up for what you believe in, regardless of public opinion. And so entrepreneurs are always misunderstood, misinterpreted, miscommunicated, right? Because <laughs> we're crazy. You know, to be an entrepreneur, you have to be a little crazy. If you're not crazy to give up all these other things that normal people are not willing to give up, then don't be an entrepreneur, right? Uh, th that means just, just, just follow. It's okay. It's okay to be a follower, right? But an entrepreneur at the end of the day is a pioneer and someone that, that paves the way and, and creates new paths that had not been there before uh, had they not been there. And so I think sacrifice, suffering, and, and really sticking to your guns is, is, is really what it's about when you're an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship and leadership seem to go hand in hand for you. How would you define a good leader? I think at the end of the day, leadership is about service. It's about how can I help you become better? How can I add you value? How can I serve you something that is going to make life easier or better or richer or, or more wonderful? End of the day, it's just not about you. It's not about me. You know, I don't, I don't start these companies, you know, that I've started or, you know, invested in even companies that I, I believe in. I, I do it because I believe it's serving a greater purpose. I believe it can create change. I think there are, you know, uh, systems that need to be disrupted because they're corrupted and they need to be reformed. And that's why I invest in disruptive technologies. That's why I invest in media and entertainment because I believe media and entertainment is the strongest cultural force uh, to influence minds and, and change social behavior, right? Um, and and I, I believe in, 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 in social good and social enterprise, giving back, you know, whether that's, you know, to clean energy, to taking care of the orphan and the widow, um, and to, to bring in water to those that don't have water, you know, around the world, uh, or, or, or making sure that our air is cleaner and we're saving ourselves from this apocalyptic environment that we live in uh, <laughs> that is, is, is like living hell and, and how do we actually change that? So again, it's about change and changing the world and changing our communities and changing our families and ultimately ourselves uh, for the best. Jason, I love how you value being a good entrepreneur as someone who manifests qualities of a leader, that an entrepreneur is someone who understands sacrifice and serving the people, that it's about working for the greater good. But let's be frank, uh, this all sounds wonderful, but in reality, it's hard. I mean, we're human and sometimes we want to put ourselves first. Like you said, it's not easy. How do you find that balance between what you want and your needs versus what you know you need to do for this greater purpose that you have? It's a great question, Jazz. Um, you can't give what you don't have, right? So if my cup is half full, I can only give half. If my cup is full, I can give full. If it gets empty, I have nothing to give. So this cup has to constantly be filled, right? Or else I can't enjoy this great, amazing African tea that I'm having right now. <laughs> um, and what that means is the first love is self-love, right? You have to love yourself, right? And, and that love comes in many different ways. Some people have a higher power, whether that's a faith or religion, right? For me as a Christian, that's God, that's Jesus Christ, that I have a relationship with a higher power that fills this tank 
this human body, this human soul, with the love and energy and spirituality that I need, right, to stay positive, to, to, to stay energized, to be inspired, right? So for other people, you know, that's many different ways, right? But I have to constantly pour in love and resources to fill my own cup, the Jason Ma cup, right? And so what does that mean? That means reading the Bible. That means, for me, meditation and prayer. For me, that means being a voracious reader and reading at least a book a week, right? For me, that means spending time with people that I really love and I know love me for me, like my mom, my dad, my sisters, and my family, my close and cl my close knit best, best friends, right? That can tell me like it is. And, and as the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. And so for me, it's, it's constantly loving self is, is key. Cause if I, if I don't love myself, I can't love other people, right? If I don't like myself, I'm not going to like you. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> I'm always going to find something wrong with you. If I don't like me, you know what I'm saying? And that's why people hate on people, you know, professional ha player haters hate themselves. You know what I'm saying? Like people that hate is because they hate themselves. It's not because they hate. It's because they can't stand why they're in the situation they're in and why you're in the situation that seems in their mind better than them and they don't have anything else to say but to complain, right? And so <laughs> so, so, so PhD, play a hating degree. Like everyone has a PhD if they don't love themselves, right? Self-love is so important, right? That you have to know that I love myself because I know God loves me. My higher power loves me. I am constantly filling my tank with the things that make me feel that love and that positive energy. I have to recognize that I'm both body, soul, and spirit. So how do I love myself physically? Am I eating right? Am I exercising? Am I, am I, am I going out for runs? Am I having my, my, my adrenaline and my serotonin and whatever it is you know, uh, at, at, at its peak, right? My soul, my mind, my will, and my emotions. Am I, you know, having the right people in my life? You know, is my dating life healthy, right? Is my, is, is my family healthy, right? Am I reading the right books? Am I taking in the right information? Or am I constantly, you know, looking at things and, and inputting things into my system that are negative, right? So I have to think about that. Then it goes into the spiritual side. Like, if I'm a Christian, am I having spiritual accountability? Am I having worship service? Am I praying? Am I meditating? Am I reading my Bible? If I'm Muslim, am I going to the mosque? Am I, you know, being mentored and studying the Quran? If I'm Hindu or whatever it might be, what is, or your no religion? Are you doing your yoga? Are you meditating? Are you doing some transcendentalism? I don't know. But my point is we are tripart beings, body, soul, and spirit. And you have to love all three or else it becomes imbalanced, right? Right. But ultimately your spiritual person is the most important because that is what then motivates and inspires and catalyzes your motivation for your soul and your actual physical being now everyone talks about how it's important to find balance in life but really it's like the most difficult test problem that for some take an entire lifetime to solve what's your take on achieving balance balance to me is all about understanding your center, right? There's nothing that's bad or good, okay? And when I say that, I'm saying like money is neutral. It could be used for good. It could be used for bad. Fire is neutral. It could be used to warm your fireplace. It could also be used as an arson to burn down houses and neighborhoods. Uh, so you have to look at life neutrally and you have to look at life through your center. Okay, I'm given money. How do I look at this money? What is my definition for money? What is my purpose with money? If my purpose for, for money is just so that I can get more rich and buy more things, then I would say that is your center, but your center most likely will veer, right, into greed and into excessiveness, and that leads to wild living, debauchery, whatever you wanna call it, right? Or if I look at money as something that is a tool, 
that I can use to give to help others, right? To, to, to make a difference, to invest, to multiply, make more money, to help more people, right? Then you look at money neutrally. One is pleasure or to serve myself. The other is to serve others. If I look at it as serving others, then I would recognize money as just a tool that I'm stewarding, uh, a resource that I'm stewarding, a gift that I'm given to manage, right? And so I think about it where, okay, I'm only gonna use so much because that's all I need, but the rest I can invest, I can give away, I can donate, I can use to help, right? That's where people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Mark Zuckerberg have realized, you know, I'm one person that can eat three meals a day, sleep on one bed, drive maybe one car, live maybe mainly in one house. What does a billion dollars or a hundred billion dollars make any difference? Because I could probably just live on a million, right? And and so then you realize now all these billionaires they have this thing called the giving pleasure. Like, yeah, if anyone that has at least a billion dollars of assets individually, that they give at least 500 million, right, to charity and to causes, right, that can actually make a difference in the world. Because who can't live on $500 million, okay? So let's just get real here, right? Uh, 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 you, no one needs $500 million to live, let alone 5 million. So I think my point is, balance is all about, first of all, what is your definition and your evaluation and your understanding and your purpose for what you have. Once you know what you have and you know your purpose, that dictates how you live your life, right? That dictates how responsible you are, how much you save, how you spend your time, who you spend your time with, you know what I'm saying? And so in that sense, I think it all goes back to, again, you have to know who you are and what you're trying to do. Once you know who you are and what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish, then you're able to maximize your time by being responsible with your time, manage your time, right? So that you can find that balance, right? To actually get your mission or your purpose accomplished and done. You know, the people that I know that are the most balanced, they have a regiment, right? They, 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 they know what their boundaries are, what they say yes to, what they say no to, right? They have to know what's priority. Is it low priority, mid priority, high priority? You know, I talk about it with my team every week. Okay, we get so many deals coming in you know, which ones, first of all, filter it, look at it, let's discuss it, and then we'll know, okay, is this a high priority deal? Is this a mid priority deal? Is this a low priority deal? Or is this a, just a non-deal, right, at a pass, right? So you have to prioritize, right? Balance is all about prioritizing. I can only do so much in a day, I only have 24 hours, so I know I can only have X amount of calls, I can only probably have, you know, X amount of time to eat, X amount of time to sleep, X amount of time to work out, right? Uh, X amount of time for, 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 for fun, right? And, and leisure, right? X amount of time for Netflix binging, okay? <laughs> but like, you have to prioritize. If you don't have a plan, you plan to fail. We talked about your perspective on balance from a personal standpoint, but let's talk about it in relationships, specifically in the workplace. A well-rounded, balanced team is essential for a company to thrive. What are some attributes to consider when choosing who to add to the team? What are your thoughts about working with friends? One tip I learned from Jack Ma in a talk was never start a business with your best friend. <laughs> best friends should stay best friends. Uh, best friends should not be your business partner. Um, keep it personal, meaning your close friendships. And keep business business. I believe in integrity and character more than I believe in talent. Right. Talent can take you there, but it's your character that keeps you there. That's right. You know, integrity and character are of utmost importance when it comes to forming your team and really your personal relationships as well. But even if two people have great character, not all of us can get along. Moreover, sometimes life just works in ways where we grow apart. Tell me about your experience with relationship fallout and how you dealt with that. I've had fallouts in my life uh, at various different seasons and times of my career, uh, both in ministry, both in my artistry, as well as my 
my career as an entrepreneur. Um, when you have fallouts, whether it's disagreements, uh, whether it's you know you getting screwed or, or backstabbed or someone did you wrong or cheated you, um, it always is devastating and it's always um, disappointing and always difficult. And I've gone through many moments in my life uh, where I hit rock bottom and I lost friends, uh, I lost communities. Um, but I always look at it as a lesson. Uh, I believe great leaders look at challenges, circumstance, challenging circumstances, crises as an opportunity to learn and an opportunity to change. So if my leadership lens is, oh no, why is this happening to me? And why me? And, and I only get angry and resentful and bitter, uh, then I think I have not learned. But if I put on a, a leadership lens to learn, I can look at any crisis, any circumstance that is bad, that is happening to me. And I ask the first question, did I do anything to contribute to this, right? Before I point the person, before I point the finger at someone else, I'm gonna point the finger at myself. You know, did I do something here because I'm not perfect that led to this fallout? Um, and if I did or didn't, I, I I will then empathize, and then think about okay, if I was in this person's shoes, you know, what would I have done? And ultimately no matter how bad it is, what can I learn from this? And how can I pivot, iterate, and keep moving forward? Or through this crisis and challenge create an opportunity. The best innovations, the best ideas, where people made the most money was when things hit rock bottom and they had nothing left to hold on to from the old in order for them to be open to embrace the new, right? Mm -hmm. So when I look at everything in life, I don't think anything happens by accident. I think there are people in your life that are there for a season, but life is seasonal, and they're not supposed to be with you forever, right? Maybe you had a girlfriend or a boyfriend that was amazing, and they're your first love for three, four, five years, but you know what? You outgrew each other, and, and, and now they're better off with someone else, and you're better off with someone else, right? And so in that sense, it's always through the, the lens of what am I learning from this? How am I responding? Am I going to be bitter, or am I going to get better? Right? Am I going to have a pity power party or am I going to be powerful and, 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 and take responsibility? If I made mistakes, do I own those mistakes and am I repenting? Am I changing and, 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 and getting correction within myself so that I don't make those mistakes again so that I can become a better person and do better next time and not make the same mistake next time? Right. So I think if you have this disposition of humility, right? I think humility is really at the end of the day, admitting and acknowledging and accepting who you really are. Right. Right. Versus trying to be something that you're not. Right. Uh, pride, ego, jealousy, fear, anger, dissension, that all comes out of ego and insecurity and fear and not knowing who you are and accepting who you are. Right. Because if you know you're wrong, just admit it, fess up, be a man. Right. And, and take it, acknowledge it, take responsibility for it, and change it, right? And, and, and we're all human, we all make mistakes, but it's not about falling backwards, it's about falling forwards, right? We gotta fall forward in life, and that's in personal life, that's in your career life, that's in your spiritual life. Uh, we're only human, we all need grace, but we can all keep moving forward if we're willing to learn. Awesome. Jason, I love your mentality to take unfavorable circumstances and use it as an opportunity to grow. It's definitely something that we should all learn from and hone. Obviously, nobody likes conflict, and as a society, we fear things falling apart. But hey, if the hurt comes, so will the happiness. I think the spirit of an entrepreneur is the ability to take risk and not be afraid to fail. Every great entrepreneur, every great leader 
is also a great failure, right? We all failed at some point, but it's not whether or not we failed. It's if we failed and we stayed a failure and stayed there, or we made the decision to get back up, keep trying and, and to learn from our mistakes and, and become a better person uh, and keep moving forward. That's the difference between, to me, a failure and a success. A failure or someone that fails is someone that doesn't try, right? The Bible says a, a righteous man falls down a hundred times, but he gets back up, right? And so I've fallen a hundred times, but you know I choose by God's grace to get back up and, and to keep moving forward. And so I think that's what it is. You have to be willing to fail. If you if you're not willing to be if you're not willing to fail, then don't start don't 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 start a startup. Don't try to be an entrepreneur. Don't try to be a founder because you're going to fail. Let's talk about your investment in Triller. Why did you choose this app over other short form video apps out in the market? Okay, we're going to go there, huh? <laughs> It's very, We're going there. It's a very I'm sensitive. Curious. It's a very sensitive topic in the world right now. I, I'm not going to get into the details, um, but I will share kind of how I got involved with the opportunity. Um, so there's um, there's a fund uh, that I that I'm a network partner uh, with that you know, Goodwater Capital, um, and and we invest in consumer tech only, um, and uh, I don't know five years ago uh, the musically opportunity came and I was able to help with that deal and get it done um, by bringing on uh, Ariana Grande onto the platform and at the time it was still this music karaoke app that was going crazy and scaling with tweens right young kids but it didn't really have any major celebrities on it just yet like music artists specifically and at the time it was a hot app and all the top Silicon Valley VCs wanted to invest in it um, the top names and we were just a new fund. And so it was gonna be hard for us to get a seat at the table and get an allocation. So um, I came in with my network and entertainment and met with the founders of, of Musical.ly in Shanghai, as well as LA. I was like, hey, you know, I'm gonna bring on some major A-list celebrities uh, and music artists to use Musical.ly officially. And, and, but if I do that, I really need an allocation. You gotta give me an allocation in this next round. And so that's how, uh, I was able with Goodwater to invest into Musical.ly and get an allocation. We delivered Ariana Grande, uh, other talents, and it really uh, exploded and scaled from there. And within less than a year and a half, it got acquired by ByteDance and then became TikTok. So about a year and a half later, I think it was 2018, <clears throat> a VC friend of mine introduces me uh, to the current CEO of Triller, Mike Liu, and was like, hey, here's a company that's similar to Musical.ly, but it's in a different demographic it's also growing, and you should check it out, uh, which was Triller. And so at the time, I was looking at Triller, and it was you know mainly, um, I would say, in the black and brown communities, young young kids, right, and mainly hip hop driven, right, which was you know my cup of tea as far as music genre and taste. And then I think 2018 was when things really began to uh, get interesting. Um, so 2018, um, around I think February March, you started seeing a lot of these major artists like uh, Chance the Rapper, Cardi B, Eminem, DJ Khaled, Chris Brown, all started posting Triller videos because it became so popular, right, uh, mm -hmm. among young black youth, right, in America. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the hip hop culture, it just became a brand. It became, mm -hmm. they are TikTok, right? And so they started expressing themselves in these videos and we had the ability to have all the music licenses from Sony Warner Universal so they could you know, make these videos to their favorite hip hop songs and other songs. And so it started growing and scaling. And I was like, wait, I've seen this playbook before. You know, I saw it with Musical.ly, with Ariana. Mm -hmm. I know what, what happens when celebrity and top notch music artists get on a platform like this, you're gonna really begin to see scale. So, Coincidentally, I was in London uh, speaking around that time at a Founders Forum conference on digital media, and I have a friend, <laughs> and he's the, his name is Lord Wei, W-E-I. He's the only Chinese Asian Lord in the British UK House of Lords. It's like, it's like Congress, right? He's like a congressman, right? So oh, wow. Parliament, 
House of Lords, right? And so he was like, hey, Jason, if you're in London, let's get together, come to the House of Lords, the actual, you know, building, and let me give you a tour and show you around and we'll have a, you know, spot of tea, right? And so I'm like, sure, <laughs> why not, right? So I go, I get, you know, checked and stamped and whatever, and I go meet with, with Lord Wei. And so do this whole tour, and then there's this, like, famous tea room where, like, Prince Charles and Diana had tea and da-da-da. So he was like, hey, you should come with me um, to go check out uh, the tea room, and we can have, you know, some, some tea and some crackers, right? And so we, we go into the tea room, and there's these three guys, these Brits there, sitting, and, and Lord Wade goes, hey! And they knew each other, and he goes, hey, you guys need to meet Jason. Jason, you need to meet these guys because they, they, they're starting a music artificial intelligence company called Mass Tracks. And they show me the technology. And I'm actually shocked. I'm actually impressed. I, I was not expecting because I've been pitching music AI companies and tech. And a lot of times, 95% of it's just like, you know, pass. But they had this technology where you can put any photo and video to the AI. And you can put 100 different songs to that AI. And it will spit out 100 completely different edits uh, with that photo and video footage to any song differently professional music video professional short film so i was like yo this is this is actually legit this is dope i was like what are you guys doing with this and they're like well you know we were offered by a major company to to be bought out recently we're thinking about that or we're thinking about raising capital uh to start our 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 own competitor tiktok and i said huh i remember writing it out on a napkin i was like i got a better idea i was like what if you came back with me to LA and we merged your company, Mass Tracks, with this company that I advise and know called Triller. And we can put the two together because with their brand and their user base, right, and their growth with your tech and your AI, we can create the next TikTok, right? Ooh. That's a story. And they were like, sounds like a good idea, mate. And, uh, <laughs> We went back to LA and, you know, the deal was, was made. We were able to merge uh, the two companies and then we, you know, invested uh, through Proxima Media, who are my partners, uh, Ryan and Bobby, and we were able to create a, a bigger story and, and, a, and a bigger, uh, more robust company because now it has a brand and a platform, but also technology. And what do you think led Triller to grow into the company that it is today? Um, leadership. You know, it always comes to leadership. You know, I'm not operational. I'm, I'm a co-owner and an investor. Um, but, you know, I don't do day to day. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, Bobby, the executive chairman, Mike, who's been building this for, what, almost four years now. Um, they, they, they're like Steve Jobs every day. You know, they're just in there. How do we make this better? User feedback. Talking to the influencers. How do we make this better? You know, how do we improve? How do we iterate? How do we change? How do we create a new product? Talking to the tech team, figuring out how we make it, make it more seamless. Like it's constantly product, 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 iteration, improvement on the product, right? And I think that's what makes the iPhone the iPhone and every iPhone, you know, better and, and every version of Apple better because they're constantly improving the camera and improving the software and improving, you know, this and that. And so I think really at the end of the day, it was this obsession, right? Uh, not just with Mike and, and the original company, but now you have AI, comp you know, music AI, who's now our, our CTOs, our, our technology division, with new leadership plus the original leadership, all Voltroning together and saying, hey, we're going to make the best social video app in the world, right? And, and with that mission, and if you're going to beat TikTok, right, you have to have healthy competition. It's great that TikTok is there because that makes us work that much harder on a daily basis on how do we compete, how do we differentiate, how do we become better, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's that mission to become the best social video app in the world that keeps the team working 24 hours, 24-7, you know, seven days a week, you know, with a little bit of rest. But it's that ambition versus, hey, we have something great. Let's just go sell it, right? You know, we're not settling for mediocrity. Right, we're we're only going to settle for the best and 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 for excellence. Are you working on any new projects now? Actually, I am. Um, so, 
my main passion project right now is a, is a platform that I'm building called EST, Eastern Standard Time. And it really is the, I would say, convergence of 20 years of being the media entertainment technology industry and having experience with music artists and actors and actresses and directors and talent all the way to building a digital media brand and platform like 88 Rising, uh, understanding you know, content, social virality, uh, to building my premium film company. Uh, it's a company called Stampede Ventures that I didn't get into, but we produce you know, premium movies and TV series and documentaries uh, with my partner, Greg Silverman, a former president of Warner Brothers, and Gideon Yu, the former CFO for Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we literally sold 50 movie and TV projects in the last 24 months. So seeing the power of premium content. Um, and then, of course, the investments in Musical.ly and, and, and now TikTok and Triller and seeing the power of social video and, and social video interaction and the virality around that. Um, I begin to think about, like, how can I take all these experiences and put them into one platform uh, to fulfill, you know, my mandate? Right, which is to bridge East and West through media, entertainment, and technology, through stories and talent. That's always been my life mission statement, uh, career-wise. And so, for me, you know, can I build a digital media brand? Can I build a a social community online? And can I create premium stories and content uh, to the world? And Eastern Standard Time is a play on words. Uh, I'm basically saying it's not New York time, EST but it's Asia time. Uh, it's, 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 it's stories need to be told from Asia by Asians to the rest of the world, but currently only Western media outlets like CNN and Fox and New York Times and Washington Post and Vice, they control the Eastern narrative to the rest of the world. Right. And, and, and Asian media companies locally are great for the local, but they don't have a local for global uh, uh, platform uh, to tell Asian stories by Asians to Asia and to the rest of the world. And so EST is really a platform where I'm able to have one main mission in my mind, and that is to give every Asian young person a microphone to tell their story. And so this is kind of my version of Vice Media, uh, you know, kind of meets Triller, TikTok, Spotify, you know what I'm saying, meets, you know, A24, HBO. Right, and so it's, I can't get into the details of the platform, uh, but I've raised you know uh, venture capital seed round. I funded it mostly myself, uh, a pre-seed, uh, built an Asian Avengers team, and you're gonna find out a lot about EST and Eastern Standard Time come next year, 2021. And so very, very excited about that. You've certainly accomplished so much already as the pioneer bridging the way for East and West representation cross-border. Why is pursuing EST important to you? Yeah, I mean, again, as an entrepreneur, I just see a gap, right? Um, Asia does not have its own media voice and brand uh, to the rest of the world. Um, and that's a problem because post-pandemic, Asia is the new leadership of the world, right? It is the majority of the world. It is the highest concentration of people in the world. It's the highest population of consumers in the world. It's 60% of the world's youth population is Asian. That's over 2 billion. And how can this generation of Asian young people not have a voice in media to tell their stories, right, at the highest level? And so to me, that's, that's the goal, is, is to create a, a digital next generation media platform that socializes editorial stories from Asia to the whole world, right? What are the next parasites? What are the next raids? Right? What is who's the next Wong Kar Wai? Who's the next Bong Joon Ho? You know, who's 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 the next you know major leader uh, or, or scientist or technologist or founder of a startup from Asia that will have a platform to give voice? It's it's no longer the West that's leading the planet. It is now the century of the East, and that's what EST is about. It's about East, and that's why it's called EST. Jason, speaking with you today, I can see that you have constantly been on the go. How did you stay motivated to keep going? Did you ever take a break due to setbacks or burnout? Uh, many, 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 many times. Um, I've had burnout. Um, I mean, that's where you have to learn balance, right? That's how I've, 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 I've realized that you're only human, number one. No one's Superman. No one's Jesus Christ. No one's God. Um, we're all human. We're flesh. Uh, we all make mistakes. 
and um, but we learn from these mistakes and, and we keep moving forward. Um, I think for myself, you know, it's, it's been learning to take breaks daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, to, like I said before, love myself and fill that love tank so I have more love to give. Uh, if you don't have time uh, to be filled, you won't be able to pour out to others. <clears throat> so I think that's very, very important. And, um, and, and again, surrounding yourself with the, with the right people in your life um, that keep you sane, that can be honest with you, that don't just say yes to everything and are, and are yes men or yes women and constantly applauding you. You need people that will tell you the brutal, honest truth if you're doing something stupid or something wrong or something that's off course from your mission or your goal or your center. So I would say definitely um, you have to have time for yourself. And secondly, you have to surround yourself with great people. And it's a small bunch. You don't need a lot. You just need a few people. You know, uh, Jesus only had 12 and he really only had three, right? Uh, uh, While he was on the earth running, you know, the biggest organization on the planet now, Christianity. Um, So (laughs) in that sense, um, love yourself and surround yourself with people that love you. Jason, what is your life mission? And how have you stayed true to your mission throughout your life? My, my life mission from a spiritual standpoint that I don't talk about is to know and make known the manifest presence of God to my generation. Um, I believe that God's presence is tangible. I believe that it can be felt. Maybe not in what you think, just like a church service or you're at a Buddhist temple meditating, but I believe it's, you know, when you watch a movie in a theater and it's Shawshank Redemption and that end scene when you see that reconciliation, right, between two opposing forces and you begin to get that movie magic tingle and you start crying or you start feeling goosebumps, right? That's the presence of God. It's 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 these stories, it's 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 this content, right, that wherever you go when you get inspired and you get touched and you are encouraged, whether someone sends you a note or someone prays for you or someone celebrates you or whatever it might be, an experience, uh, that's what I want to make my life mission about. I want to know God's presence that is all beautiful, all loving, uh, all knowing, and all all good. And I want to 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 take that that I've been given, God loves me, I love myself, and then take that love and give it to others, right? How I'm gonna do that in my specific career life mission is to bridge East and West through media, entertainment, and technology through stories and talent. That is what I know I'm good at. That's where I know I have the right resources. And and, and that's where I know, you know, I've been called, ultimately. Right? I don't try to do something else that I know I'm not called to do. Right? If you're a fish, don't try to be a bird. If you're a bird, don't try to be a fish. Right? <laughs> you're created to swim, swim. You're created to fly, fly. Right? I know my lane is east and west. I know my sectors is media, entertainment, and t- technology. I, I know, you know my, 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 my resource and my strength is through telling stories and working with incredibly talented people. So how do I create platforms within that mission that can serve that ultimate purpose of telling great stories to the world that ultimately people will become inspired and encouraged and the world becomes a better place, ultimately experiencing God's goodness and presence. What top three advice would you give Jason Ma in his 20s? Don't be so hard on yourself, number one. Work hard and stay humble, number two. And don't chase the hype, but build your life on principles and values that are fundamentally unchangeable. And surround yourself with the people that will solidify that. I think when you're young, you often chase hype, you chase the trend, you chase what's easy, what's popular, what's gonna make you more famous, more money, you know, more fun. Um, 
but ultimately those things will bite you in the ass and the things that last are not usually shiny they're not usually attractive um, the things that really last are based on values and principles that never change and 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 that to me now that I'm almost 40 uh, I look back and I wish I would have not at a young age you know uh, chase things that didn't last um, but really focus on things that that do and that's your faith and that's your family and that is your true and close real friendships that add value you know people are like elevators they either take you up or they take you down and you have to choose these elevators carefully and what does success mean to you success means doing what god created you to do i think a lot of young people uh especially in this instagram tiktok generation we are constantly looking at others versus looking at ourselves yes so we are forced or we allow ourselves to compare ourselves to others when in actuality we should only be comparing ourselves to ourselves mm -hmm. the only person you should be in competition with is yourself am i better today than i was yesterday am i healthier today than i was yesterday am i more educated today than i was yesterday am i more spiritual today than i was yesterday do i love myself more today than i did yesterday Mm -hmm. Am I working harder today than I was yesterday? Your only competition is yourself and the bar you set for yourself, right? So success is a bar that you have to set for yourself and you can't know who you are unless you know who created you and what this higher power, call it God or whatever it might be, the universe created you for. So luckily, Michael Jordan found out that he was called to play basketball and become the greatest of all time. And so did Kobe, and so did LeBron. And, and, and Steve Jobs you know, found out that you know, his calling was to create you know, computer product that would make life easier. You know, Mother Teresa discovered her purpose was to take care of the poor and by doing so, inspiring millions and billions of others to go out and do the same. Martin Luther King found out his purpose was a fight for civil rights because he saw that there was a major gap of injustice and racism and he was gonna fight that fight through nonviolence and by doing so created uh, a more free and more equal America. End of the day, these are big names, but whether you're called to be a housewife and that's your biggest dream or whether you're called to be an engineer or you're called to be a garbage man, or you're called to be a TikTok star, or you're created and called to be a sports athlete, or you're called to be the next Elon Musk, or, or, or the next president of the United States or, or, or China. It doesn't matter. It's really at the end of the day, are you doing your best to be the best version of yourself? And so if you're gonna be a garbage man, be the best damn garbage man that ever existed. Okay, if you're called to be a housewife, be the best amazing housewife and, and mother to your children and, and, and wife to your husband and, and, and to your community for the rest of your life. If you're called to be whatever, an athlete, be the best athlete, be the best ballerina, be the best fisherman, be the best whatever it is that you're called to do. But know that what you do does not define who you are. Who you are is that you're a spiritual being, you're a son of God, you're a daughter of God, you are you. There is only one you, there's no other you, but just you. Now from that place of your spiritual identity, that then motivates and catalyzes and inspires what you do, right? That now is a gift to the world. So how do you find your calling, your purpose is find your talent, find your gift, marry that or partner that with your passion and then you'll find your purpose. Jason, thank you so much for your time today. I love your message about the importance of figuring out who you are from within, what your God-given talents are, and spend your life relentlessly working towards utilizing your talents to contribute to your larger purpose, the greater good. 
And yes, we will make mistakes along the way and take some unexpected turns, but that is your way. That's my way. And that's what makes it beautiful. Look, I, I really appreciate you. I think this is a privilege for me to be on the first My Way. Uh, this is definitely Jason Ma My Way. Uh, it's, it's not a, like I said, a traditional path to what I've done and what I've become and where I'm going, but it is my story. And this is my journey. And I'm very honored and thankful that you allowed me to share it. And uh, I think uh, you're awesome. And you are the Asian Oprah of the uh, uh, new 2020 pandemic generation. So uh, <laughs> go get him, Tiger. Thank you so much, Jason. All right. Peace. Bye. Who's My Way will we explore next? Please like, subscribe, and share. And let's go find out together.